Taxonomy and phylogenies are essential for understanding the relationship between animals, uh, different species, different populations, and how we organize them and understand them is uh, can be thought of in different ways. Taxonomy as a way of naming and grouping them, and, and phylogenies as a way to understand the relationships with um, evolution in mind. So we'll discuss these principles in this lesson. So Carl Linnaeus was the, not the first person to take up taxonomy, where he was naming and classifying um, organisms. I think naturally all humans will do that. Aristotle um, also did that, tried to put them in groups and um, organize them. And kind of is our first recognized histor historical record of, of somebody doing that. But uh, Carl Linnaeus took on this as kind of his lifetime pursuit, and he did a lot of naming and classifying organisms and classified them down to the most specific point, a species, which he uses a two-part Latin name to identify. Binomial means two names, nomenclature is the naming and things, so this is called binomial nomenclature. And the specific epithet then is both the genus and the species. The genus is capitalized and the species is uh, lowercase. And it's either underlined or italicized. So here is a cougar, the scientific name using this system is puma con color. There are other large cats who belong to the puma genera, but only the cougar is puma con color. It is also included the hierarchical classification for grouping organisms from more general to specific, the most general being the kingdom. And actually we've added another classification larger than that, which is the domain. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species is the full classification. And each of these units then, class, for example, is a taxon. Multiple units then would be taxa. So it's, that's a taxonomic unit or a way of grouping units at any level. These are somewhat arbitrary taxa because who decides, well, what similarities create a genera versus an order or whatever. But a rank-free taxonomy is currently being worked on that looks more at evolutionary relationships and is based on genetics. Systematics then is a little bit different than taxonomy because it includes the relationship to evolutionary descent with organisms. So a taxonomic classification of tetrapods would be something with four legs, looking at the morphological characters and we would group them all there. Well, what do we do with snakes? Snakes don't have four legs, but we know them evolutionarily to fit within that same group. Uh, they just evolved a body form without legs. And so systematics would take into account that snakes are within the same group as salamanders, as you see here, as a tetrapod. So as an evolutionary group, not as a um, just morphological character group. A species uh, needs to have uh, three things for its definition. It needs to understand common descent. And so this allows us to understand, all right, well, this group of individuals all came from a uh, a single origin, a single population, or a single uh, mating pair. And it is considered our smallest distinct grouping in our taxonomic hierarchy. And those that belong to this species belong to a reproductive community. Um, and reproductive community would include then asexual organisms um, that also reproduce, but not necessarily sexually. A cosmopolitan species is one that's found throughout the world. Here's black bears. They're found throughout the world uh, in the northern hemisphere. Um, and this is their, their range. You would also see this uh, in Russia and Europe. And so it has a cosmopolitan 
geographical distribution. While an endemic species is only found in a single location, so there's the Hawaiian Islands there. You find lots of species that only are found on the Hawaiian Islands, so they're endemic to there. And you can also say endemic to North America or endemic to a state. All right, we mentioned species concept. Your book, uh, there are textbooks which have more species content, uh, concepts, but we'll stick to these four um, because some of the additional ones are really just very similar to the phylogenetic species concept where we're looking at um, relationships between organisms based on evolutionary characters, derived traits, um, and can be constructed through genetics. Um, we talked about the ecological species concept, so looking at the niche, the resources in a species use to help define what it is. Typological or what we consider morphological is just based on characters that you can see and measure, color, shape, um, length of the thorax, things like that. And the biological species concept then is based on group of interbreeding individuals. So a, a lion and a tiger, you can make a hybrid of those, but that hybrid is not fertile. So making fertile offspring naturally would constitute the same species. And if they can't, then they would be different species. <clears throat> okay. um, the way that we can measure species, which has really taken off in the past you know, 20, 30 years, is using genetics. And specifically, one gene, the C oxidase subunit one gene, which is found in the mitochondria, is necessary for pretty much any animal to live. So we have something that's standard across all animals, and then we can look at those differences. It's different enough in each of these organisms to understand um, differences among reproductive populations to help us define species. So you can look at these genetics, and then you can use those genetics to determine taxonomic groups. All right, this is a phylogenetic tree of whales, of the different species of whales in the world. Uh, a phylogenetic tree is this branching diagram, and each of those branches represents a common ancestor. Most of them also match the hierarchical classification that we've given based on morphometrics, but not always, because um, we have some derived traits which are shared, and we, if, it's a, if a trait has evolved more than once, then that confuses those things. So DNA similarities have been used to sort out then those mismatches between morphological similarity and uh, derived traits, new traits. All right, a phylogeny is a hypothesis. It's not set in stone, it's based on information, it's based on um, harmony of the information that you have, but it's subject to change. And so it's just depicted again as these kind of branches, usually dichotomous, meaning there's two branches. But if there's more than, than two at a branch point, it's called a polytony. So you see that there, we don't know what the relationship is between those four branches, so we put them together. Um, it's unclear. A basal taxa then is the early um, taxa branched off early in, in the evolutionary history. So you can see that labeled there. Sister taxa are two branches that are next to each other on the phylogenetic tree. And then branch points again represent the common ancestor and where they diverged. Here's an example of another phylogeny from whales. We've got branch points, you know, all over the point, all over the place where you see two uh, different lineages arising from there. Sister taxa, there's lots of sister taxa, the northern right whale and the southern right whale. Uh, the fin whale and the Antarctic mean, mink whale, however, are not sister taxa. They are in different lineages. Our basal taxa is the sperm whale for all the whales, but also the hippopotamus then uh, for everything on this phylogeny. And we do have a polytomy here where it has four different 
branches emerging from one node. So how that um, shift, how that relationship actually exists is unknown based on the information given for this study. So constructing a phylogeny is based on both morphological and molecular, molecular homologies. And a homology is a similar character due to shared ancestry. Uh, homoplasy then is a similar character due to conversion evolution, essentially, when two traits um, occurred simultaneously, but they don't have to do with being related to a common ancestor that also has that trait, but instead due to some environmental factor. So a whale is streamlined and a fish is streamlined. That's not because they have a common ancestor. It's because they both live in the ocean and it's been selected for that streamlined shape. That's a homoplasy. Um, whereas a homology, you know, the fact that um, both spiders and whales have mitochondria, that's because of shared an ancestry. That's a homology. All right, cladistics is another way of representing phylogenies, and we're trying to understand how to group organisms. And it's having to do with both ancestors and the descendants. A monophyletic group, as you can see in that yellow area, contains the point from New World monkeys and everything else branching to the right of that. You can go back and you can find, all right, we've circled all of these, and we're going to call these um, uh, primates, right? And so the primates is a monophyletic group. All right. Whereas if we make a group that includes some, uh, but not all of the descendants of an ancestor, that would be a paraphyletic group. And so prosimians, sorry, the monophyletic group was simiformes. Prosimians uh, is a paraphyletic group. And that would be lemurs, lorises, and tarsiers. So these are primates, I think, of the Madagascar. Polyphyletic groups then don't really make sense. So that's where you're kind of crossing and taking two um, taxa together, but they don't really have an, uh, an ancestral connection. So if we put lorises and tarsiers together and call them, you know, the brown monkey group, that's not based on the evolutionary relationship. They have different ancestors. They represent adaptive zones, right, where a group has taken on new traits, and we could call these grades. So another example is penguins are a grade of um, penguins are a grade of animals, a group within birds. All right, here's another uh, little example. If I circle this group of synapsid, that would be a monophyletic group. If I included diapsids as everything except birds, that would be a paraphyletic group. And then, oops. All right, and then if a monophyletic group, I'd take two random ones and put together. All right, so a shared derived character is an evolutionary trait that's new to a clade. We call this a synapomorphy. A shared ancestral character is a trait that originated with an ancestor. It is shared um, and thus not unique and is a simplesiomorphy. All right, so uh, an example of a simplesiomorphy for this whale phylogeny here would be um, a fluke, having a, a fluke, a large tail all whales have this, it's a shared ancestral character. An example of a synapomorphy would be that the southern, the baleenid group, baleenidae, has baleen, all right? So that's a shared derived character that we would use to then group those together. All right, we use an out group to help us make comparisons. We can then, um, look at the traits of our out group, comparing it to the in group, the one that we're interested in. And we can, if we have characters that are shared with the out group, we would take those to be ancestral traits. And then anything new and different from that out group would be 
a derived trait. So what information we're we gonna to use to make these phylogenies? Originally, all we had was the physical characters of the morphology of the, of the organisms. And that led us to um, understanding then, this is how we would group organisms. And you can see that on the A, no, sorry, B, trace, based on body plan grades. So how similar their bodies are. But when we add biochemistry and cytology, looking at chromosomes, DNA, RNA, and proteins, we get a different um, relationship, which is more inclusive of their evolution. And so our tree based on molecular comparisons on the left is considered to be more accurate. And you can see there's a big polytomy in that. And so there's the, this is still being worked on and trying to figure figure out what the actual relationships are. There are three major domains of all life, eukarya, archaea, and bacteria. Animals are part of eukarya. And uh, you can see then the relationship of plants, animals, fungi, it's a branching tree. But within then animals, we're gonna have a bunch of phyla that we're gonna go over. We're gonna study those by their evolutionary relationships. 